376. So I was thinking it barely made the cut. That perhaps the editor said it to the best of the last. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, schoolmates, members of the Orsa family, I offer these few simple words of remembrance on behalf of my generation of Queen's College, the place of his own formation and of our foundation. It is well known that in 1962, Dr. Richard Reginald Orsa became the first Guyanese to be the school's acting principal. In 1958, he had been awarded the Crane Gold Medal for the most outstanding contribution to education in British Guyana. When in 2003, the University of the West Indies honored his work and his sterling contribution to Caribbean culture and scholarship by conferring on him the honorary degree of Doctor of Letters. The university's public orator in his citation aptly described Professor Orsa as a gentle giant of a scholar and gentleman, an eloquent epitome of Caribbean cultural expression, a human computer of the language, passions, and culture of the Caribbean people. In 2004, the Barbados government awarded him that country's second highest national honor, the Companion of Honor, for his distinguished contribution to education. It has been properly recognized that Richard Hall Balsa, whom we remember today, was a towering figure in the academic and cultural landscape of the Caribbean. Since his death, tributes have poured in from the international community of scholars, and this is as it should be. In a review of his monumental dictionary of Caribbean English usage, I was invited to contribute to the Kaiko World Special in 1988. I quoted Richard's words. If this work helps, as indeed it can, to break down insular barriers, set up bridges and link up cultural roadways through the Anglophone Caribbean for a start, it will have served ultimately its highest purpose. And since the need for bridges and cultural roadways is no less compelling within territories, it is a welcome contribution to national healing to identify the various language origins that together constitute our Guyanese English. To identify, and more to the point, to recognize their objective equality of status. Washington, Farin, Bunjal, Warishi, None inferior or superior to any other, all but one brought from a distant place to take up enforced residence in these Caribbean lands. As he wrote in the preface to the dictionary, the DCEU should be an inward and spiritual operator of regional integration, even more powerful as a signal of unity than a national tribe. Dr. Olsa is probably here. But it is not Professor Dr. Richard Reginald Olsa, the eminent linguist, lexicographer, and apostle of Caribbean longness. I have come to speak of this afternoon. Instead, I have come to remember the soppy of Fawn Bender, tall as a coconut tree to a tribe of boy and his first frightening day of greetings. His black and red gum swirling and flapping as he strolled into assembly, eyes sweeping the wall for any sign of slouching or mumbling, forbidden sins in an assembly over which a respectful hush fell. John Rickford, one of those who were later to be inspired and enriched by Sophie's work in linguistics, remembers that his respect was tinged with a measure of schoolboy fear, especially so when my mind and mouth were fumbling to formulate my excuse for coming to school late. And he was simultaneously commanding me to stand up straight in that booming, resonant, and carefully articulated voice of his. I did not have the good fortune assembly to have had him as my French master in the second floor right from the beginning. <coughs> my friend Goldie is, Dickinson Alley, with whom I shared many an 
has desecrated queens, some too inglorious to recount to a gathering such as this, remembers his first lesson in French in Room 3 in 1953, his first introduction to phonetics. Sophie, he recalls, wrote the word G-H-O-T-I on the blackboard, and they were asked to pronounce it. The answer was fish. G-H, the F as in off, O, the I as in women, and T-I, the ship as in attention. My own recollections of French classes with Sophie date back from 1961. Up to that point, I cruised through my Latin, French, and Spanish classes with relatively ease and fancied myself as a language scholar. The two years I was to spend on the Sophie and up six classical brought me to a rude awakening. If we were to avoid this exasperated, oh, mon Dieu, we would have to strive for greater and greater perfection. He had no tolerance for sloppiness, crudeness of expression, and heaven forbid, grammatical errors. Instead, we had to hunt for le mot juste. Nothing less would do. His classes in explication of the text, an old form of new criticism that was to become all the rage in literature departments in the 60s and 70s, stood me in good stead all the way up to my doctoral studies in literature. In, in fact, thanks to his thoroughness and insistence on nothing less than the highest standards, I enjoy the luxury of being able to miss my first year undergraduate classes in French grammar. Such was his transforming power that even his failures turned out to be successes in the end. Nearly 60 years ago, Sophie failed in his efforts to encourage one of his students to negotiate the difficulties of the French language. 50 years later, however, Sophie's persistence transformed this failure into a kind of success when he recruited this linguistically challenged student, another friend of mine, to become an advocate for his lexicography project. In 1978, as UNESCO's first Caribbean representative, Hugh Chumley, worked the organization's foreigners in Paris, mobilized initial funding, and helped in bring the project to the attention of the Caribbean ministers of culture who in turn encouraged their governments to provide financial support for his epic dictionary of Caribbean English usage. Austere, severe, demanding, and an unrelenting perfectionist for whom intellectual rigor was a passion. That much is well known. What is perhaps less well known is the softer side that was not as well as it as advertised. It was a sight to be over the song, house master of the athletically challenged Ferdinand, running alongside an early Olympic for the last 50 yards of the 440 as he was on his way to earning his only standard point for the house. Another Bourbon house boy, Peter Gaines, has left us a record of Sophie's misplaced enthusiasm for Durban's underperforming sportsman. He says, there were inter-house competitions of every kind, and the one that Durban consistently held top position in is, was academia. However, when it came to sports in those days, we were next to hopeless, and as a first former, I was a permanent fixture of the football team, not because I was good, but because it was difficult to get 11 players interested in representing the house. Whenever we played in the competition, it was not a question whether we would lose, but by how many goals we would lose. The members of the house did not have faith in the team, and so the only support on the touchline would be Sophie. One game against Austin House, being played in torrential rain, we were down 0-6. And from the touchline, Sophie, dressed in long boots and coat, shouted, Come on, Duban. Not Durban. Pull up your socks. I took him literally and then took and pulled up my socks. Sophie yelled, not like that game. <laughs> then there was the epic, the epic upset 
when one memorable Saturday afternoon, Durgan abandoned the stars at a home house in a never to be forgotten cricket match that provided Sophie with his greatest joy as a supporter. Durgan batted first and scored a hundred plus. Pilgrim went into that and was so offshore that their three stars dashed off to book a sports club to play a hockey game. To their surprise when they returned, Durgan was batting again. Gordon and George Royer had bowled up Pilgrim for 12. The match ended in a draw. Sophie promptly wrote a song for which Sophie promptly wrote a song which was sung repeatedly at the house Christmas party. Stories about Sophie will be handed down for generations. He was a true legend. There will no doubt be the inevitable embellishments as time goes on. Lest we forget, he is credited with having pronounced the shortest of a prayer at a house feet. Best is food that we are anxious to eat. <laughs> the last time I saw him was at his home in Barbados some years ago. We talked of many things, but mostly about Diana and the condition of the country. He was dismayed. I put it mildly. We remember him today with affection and gratitude. And on, on behalf of us all, I say adieu. Even my fading memory has retained the lines of the sonnet of the great Renaissance poet he taught us to the European Pudelli. Viorou, qui comme lui a fait un beau voyage. Pour quand c'est tout là? qui conclut la poisson, et puis, et retourné, plein du sage et raison, vivre entre ses plans, le reste de son âge. It is a poem d'exile, written from afar, and sings of the yearning for home and the sweet solace of the familiar. It is a good note on which to begin. <laughs>